What an unbelievably great day. Love you guys. Love this church. It's always good coming home. And uh, if you're visiting here this morning, uh, then you're in the right place. This is the right place to be. Why don't you turn to the person beside you, give them a high five, a fist pump. If you're single and really like them, maybe swipe right, whatever you need to do. And then just grab a seat. How cool. Had a fantastic weekend and, and uh, I love technology. We're in Bellevue and online and here and it's just, uh, just amazing. What a great day to live in church. We probably live in the best era in church history right now. This is just a cool time to be in the kingdom of God. I'm excited about the Word of God today. I'd love it if you grab your Bible, go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. For those of you that don't have a Bible, the Scripture will come up on the screen behind me. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to get one. You need to have need to have the Word of God. And again, technology, get your smartphone out, download the YouVersion Bible app. It'll give you just great resource. How many people have got the YouVersion Bible app? I love it. It costs you nothing. It's there for free. And if you don't own a smartphone and want a free Bible, then stay in the Hilton and Jack of Gideons. Whatever you need to do, get yourself, get yourself a Bible. Jesus is telling a parable. It starts in verse 23. And it says this, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now in the parable, Jesus is uh, illustrating a truth. So everything that is said in here is by design. And so the number 10,000 is deliberate, and it's there because in that day, in, in numerics, this is like the biggest number. Like if you were trying to throw out a huge number to blow people's mind, back then they would use the number 10,000. I, I don't know if your family has a number that you use, where you know, like, oh, I love you, no, I love you more, no, I love you more, like, oh, I love you. We, we use the word kajillion. Kajillion's the number that just wipes out any other number on the planet. So this is like old school Kajillion, 10,000 talents. And the talent was the heaviest weight that they would use to measure out gold, silver, or, or bronze. Then it goes on and says, but he was not able to pay. So his master commanded that he be sold, his wife, children, and all that he had and payment be made. Again, if you couldn't pay a debt, generally they just take you. But this debt is so large, it requires him, his wife, his kids, everything. Uh, the, the talent was equivalent to about 20 years salary for the average worker. This guy is 200,000 years in debt. This made somebody feel really good about your credit card bill right now. 200,000 years in debt. And so he is unable to pay. And the servant fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. I'll pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, not intelligence, with compassion. Because he was patient for the next 200,000 years, he'd pay it off. Released him, forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And so you have a servant who's just been forgiven 200,000 years debt, goes out, runs into a guy that owes him some money, and it says he owes him a hundred denarii. Now a denarii is around about one day's salary for the average worker. So this guy owes him uh, about a, a quarter of a year of, of salary. And so, a third of a year, should I say, of salary. And so he was not able to pay what he owed him. His fellow servant fell down and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And the Bible says he would not, but went and threw him into prison that he should pay the debt. So the contrast is a servant who owes a king 200,000 years of debt and gets that wiped out. He then finds somebody who owes him just you know a few months of debt and will not forgive him and throws him into jail. There are two main players in the parable, the king and the servant. The king, let's call him the cajillionaire 
because he's got the resources, the mindset, the ability to wipe out an unpayable debt. And then you've got the servant who finds somebody who owes him in consideration a small amount, but is unable to forgive the debt and then makes him go into jail. If you could take the name king and servant out and place your name in there, the two characters in the parable, which one would you choose to be? I think most of us, deep down somewhere, would say, oh, I'd want to be the king. I, I'd want to be the kajillionaire. I'd want to be in the position that could wipe out that debt, that could create that freedom. I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. I want to talk about the kajillionaire mindset. But before we do that, let's just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to work with all of us today. God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it's alive. We thank you that it's powerful. We thank you that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, able to get into areas of our life and bring supernatural change. We ask you to do that today. You're a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. And these men and women that showed up today could have been anywhere else, but they chose to be in your house. And so reward them today, God, by allowing them to leave better than when they came in. And I know there are people out of here this morning that you want to do supernatural, specific things in their life. Have your way with us, Holy Spirit. More than anything, God, I pray, oh Jesus, please help me, God, not to be boring. And God, I pray for the people that are here today that you'd help them not to be boring either because that's always really, really horrible in Jesus' name. And everyone said... How many of you by a show of hands have ever been asked a question and you feel like there's a serious agenda attached to the question? Anybody ever had that? It's like a leading a question, like a loaded question. My, my youngest daughter will do that all the time. She'll just check me a random question. Hey, Dad, can you do me a favor? Question mark. Nothing added. I'm always nervous to respond with a yes because I'm not quite sure what that favor is. But my wife, she's the queen of the loaded question of the question with the agenda. It'd be late at night, get into bed, just get under the covers, turn the light out, you know, do the whole, you know, Alexa, turn the light out. Don't even have to hit a switch anymore. How awesome is life? And I'll look at her and her beautiful eyes and she'll look back gazingly at me and, and she'll say something like, are you thinking about going upstairs and getting yourself a drink? And I'll be like, no, I actually wasn't thinking about that, but why? And then she'll be like, well, I just thought while you're up there, if you could get me a drink as well. Loaded question. In Matthew chapter 18, two questions are asked. Both have an agenda. The first one leads out the chapter in 18 verse 1. The disciples come up to Jesus and they ask this question. Who is the greatest in your kingdom? Now, this has an agenda. Their understanding of kingdom and our understanding of kingdom are from two different vantage points. For them, they haven't seen a cross. They haven't experienced a resurrection. There is no ascension, no baptism of the Holy Spirit yet, and no birth of the church. And so in their mindset, what they anticipate is when Messiah comes, he'll create a political revolution. They'll overthrow the Roman government, and Messiah will rule and reign. This is what they're anticipating Jesus will do. And so what they're saying is, Jesus, when it all goes down and you take over, you're gonna need some role buddies. You're gonna need some help. Who's gonna be like the vice Messiah? Who's gonna be like the secretary of salvation? Like on your team, how, how, do, we, how do we roll in places of greatness? And so Jesus asks this question about greatness, grabs a small child and places the child in the middle. Now, the child wasn't used for the cute factor. It wasn't like so everyone goes, oh, look at the little kid. No, it, back then, the child had no value. And so he brings the child in to the middle. And then he says, if you want to be just in the kingdom of God, you've got to become like this little child. And then you've got to repent to enter into the kingdom of God then in the context of authority and using the child as the illustration, not the point, Jesus just starts dropping bombs. 
Verse 4, he says that you need to humble yourself like the little child if you want to be great. In verse 5, he says how you treat other people is a direct representation on how you treat Jesus. He says in verse 6, if you take advantage of people and treat them badly, pretty much you're in deep yogurt. Verse 7 to 9, he says, beware of offenses and try your best not to offend other people. In other words, children, please play nicely. In verse 10 to 11, he says, don't treat others arrogantly. In verse 12 to 14, he points out the value of people. He says, if one person goes astray, he'll go after the one and leave the 99 behind. In other words, everyone needs to know that you are unbelievably important. And if you're valuable, then the person beside you is valuable. And that we need to treat each other that we are important to God. You can't treat each other badly. You can't eat, treat other with disdain. We need to look after each other because we all matter to God. We are valuable to God. But then in verse 15, he's like, but if you do get hurt, if you do get disappointed, if you, if you do get offended, then you need to learn how to deal with it. Jesus, how do we become great in your kingdom? Humble yourself, come in like a little child, but then learn how to do relationships well. Learn how to do life well. It's hard to get through life without somebody offending you, somebody hurting you, somebody disappointing you. It's terrifying for me right now as a preacher because we probably live in the most easily offended generation ever to exist on planet Earth. I made that statement in Canada last week and a young man was offended that I call this generation the most easily offended generation. It's terrifying. In Chicago, it's so PC that if I use a foreign accent when I'm preaching outside the Australian one, that they edit it out of the podcast so that they won't offend people with me using a foreign accent. I'm an Australian. I live in America. I've been here nearly 18 years. There's probably not a week that goes by that somebody doesn't come up and go, G'day, mate. How you going? Try to chuck another shrimp on the barbie. And, and, and they try to do an Australian accent. And in the dozens and dozens of times that's happened, not once have I ever responded with. Are you trying to sound like me? <laughs> no, not once. You know why? Because it's funny. I give the re appropriate response, which is, <laughs> <laughs> or even just a slight chuckle. It's terrifying. You know, in the last election on the East Coast, there were students who were so traumatized by President Trump getting voted in, that their university had to create a room, a safe space, for them to go and process the trauma of the election result. But it got worse. They bought them in puppies, puppies. They bought them in puppies to cuddle so they could, and they could cuddle a puppy. These are not children in elementary. These are university students. These are grown men and women that are so traumatized they have to cuddle. Listen, I would just suggest to you that if that traumatizes you enough that you've got to go to a safe space and cuddle a puppy, life is going to beat the tar out of you because there's tougher stuff coming down the pipe. And I'd suggest to you that you buy yourself a little flock of puppies. You're gonna, you're gonna have to have those suckers carrying and jumping up, cuddle me, Fido. It's terrifying. So easily offendable. And just what Jesus says, listen, you're gonna get offended. Try not to offend people, but if it happens, if it happens to you, then he says you have a responsibility if you wanna be an authority to deal with it. 
First thing he says is, go and talk to that person about it. And, and then he says something that seems counterintuitive to the offense. He says, go and talk to them about it with a spirit of reconciliation so you can win that brother back. Most of us would go, hang on a second, aren't they supposed to win me back? They offended me. They hurt me. Aren't they supposed to win me back? No, the Bible says if you want kingdom authority, if you've been wounded, you've been offended, then with a spirit of reconciliation, go and talk to that person about it and try to win them back. Now, if that doesn't work, Jesus says, then get somebody to help you. If that doesn't work, then get the church involved. At some point, if it doesn't work, then you can disconnect. But you've got to try to reconcile. Scripture says, as far as it depends with you, be at peace with all men. It doesn't mean you're going to get on with everybody, but you've got to do your best to get on with everybody. If it's your, maybe they don't want to respond, then that's okay, but it's your responsibility to be able to deal with that. And you've got to learn how to forgive. And then Jesus goes on and starts talking about where two or three of you are gathered together. I'm there in the midst. If you bind anything, it'll be done. He starts talking about this authority comes when you operate in a spirit of reconciliation. You get kingdom authority when you learn to overcome the hurt. When you learn to overcome disappointment. When you learn to overcome... What we do is we don't confront it. We hide behind the skirt of God... And we say, God told me to leave. God told me to leave as Christian, for I'm hurt and I'm not going to deal with it. Come on, we've got all these Christian sayings. Christians never say no. You ask a Christian to do something, oh, then they go, no, we don't want to serve in children's ministry. No, they never say that. They'll say something like, oh, that's not my calling. Oh, I, I don't feel led to do that. My favorite Christian no is, oh, let me pray about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's no. Then it leads us to the second question with an agenda. So Jesus is talking about authority. He's talking about forgiveness, reconciliation. And so Peter comes out and goes, well, okay, then, then if we're going to forgive, how many times should we forgive? Seven times. Well, it's got an agenda. Because back then, the rabbis taught generous forgiveness was three times. So Peter, if he was just going on the teaching of the day, would have said, well, we should forgive three times. But Peter's trying to hustle for position. So he wants to just drop something so mind blowing. This, this is what Peter thinks is going to happen. He's like, hey, okay, guys, Jesus is talking about authority here. And uh, I just want to say, oh, look and learn, fellas, look and learn. Watch how it's done. So Peter comes out and goes, oh, Jesus, uh, we're talking about kingdom authority, talking about forgiveness. Well, and how many times should we forgive? I'm rolling out seven times. And he anticipated that Jesus would look at him and go, Yea, verily, and therefore, and yea, again, I say, yea. For even I, the Lord, Peter, am blown away by the level of awesomeness when you just came out of the gate and said we should forgive seven times. I was not anticipating such generous levels of forgiveness even to be dropped here today. And as you say that, my Savior brain is like... <laughs> That's what he thought Jesus would say. But Jesus is like, uh, why don't we try 70 times 7? And then he says, as a king who had a servant who owed him 10,000 talents. He goes into this parable and he teaches on, on the whole concept of forgiveness. I believe there are four levels of forgiveness, four levels of reconciliation, four levels that we need to move in if we're going to operate in that kajillionaire mindset. Jesus never asked us to do something he wouldn't do. 
When Jesus was on the cross, they threw everything at him. They beat him with their fists. They whipped him within an inch of his life with a scourge. They, they made a crown of thorns and mocked him and rammed it into his head. They, they ripped fistfuls of hair out of his face, out of his beard. They made him carry his cross up to Golgotha. They spat at him. They, they mocked him, nailed an accusation over his head, nailed him in to a cross, hung him up naked for everybody to see and humiliate him, his body weighing down on the cross, his rib cage crushing his lungs dying of suffocation and then Jesus looked at the people who did that to him and took authority by saying father forgive them because they don't know what they're doing four levels of forgiveness the first one simply this you've got to learn how to receive the promise Jesus didn't go to the cross for his sin he went to the cross for our sin when Jesus died for your sin he died for everything he died for your sin, past, present, and future. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of our sin. There's nothing that you've ever done. There's nothing that you can ever do that the blood of Jesus Christ can't cleanse. But there's so many people living in the shame and the guilt of their past, repenting for sins that are already done for. You're going to God, God, please forgive me for that. And heaven goes, sorry, we've checked it out. We don't even have a record of that. Yeah, but it happened in October that year, and you're like, well, it couldn't because we've checked the records and all we see is the blood of Jesus Christ. There's nothing there. You are pure, you are holy, you are white. So at some point, you've got to receive the promise and start to forgive yourself. Could you imagine how weird it would be if the king said, I forgive you, 10,000 talents, and the guy's like, that's too many? Maybe you should forgive me 9,999, let me keep one that I owe you. They would feel weird. No, the king wiped it all out. All debt is free. And that's what God has done to us. And some of you have got to start to learn to forgive yourself. It's unbelievably hard to forgive somebody else if you haven't learned to forgive yourself. The Bible is pretty clear that you need to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you don't love you, it's hard to love anybody else. We love God. He teaches us to love ourselves, and then we can love the world around us. And so we ask God to forgive us. We forgive ourselves, and then we can forgive the world around us. That's how you build authority. Second thing you're going to learn is how to reciprocate the privilege. Receive the promise and then reciprocate the privilege. Because the concept of this parable Jesus is telling us is that in comparison, it just seems natural that when the guy is forgiven that he should go out and forgive. And it seems wrong. We all know it's wrong. Why didn't you do that? And this is the point. Jesus is saying, I've forgiven you. You've got to learn how to operate in forgiveness. What God gives us the power is He's forgiven us our sin. He paid our debt. The Bible says the borrower is servant to the lender. And so God put himself in supreme authority when he paid the debt for our sin. And so now he's saying, you need to learn how to do the exact same thing. When Jesus went to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. For him to say, Father, forgive them, meant that Jesus had to forgive first. And so we need to learn how to forgive those who hurt us. Now, most times people think forgiveness is forgetting it didn't happen. Sometimes people think forgiveness is ignoring it or just burying our head in the sand or, or just not... Con no, no, forgiveness looks at the hurt. It looks at the disappointment. It looks at the pain and, and, and confronts it and says, you know what? I take authority over that. I'm not waiting for that person to fix it. The king paid the debt because he knew the servant didn't have the ability to pay the debt. When you forgive other people, it is acknowledging the fact that what they took from you, you realize they can never give that back to you. They can't pay it back. And so you take authority and say, because you can't pay it back, but it needs to be restored, I'm going to get that back from the supply that I've got in heaven. When Jesus taught us to pray, He says, you pray, say, Father, forgive me my sins as I forgive those who have sinned against me. Father, please forgive me my debt as I take authority over the debts of people that owe me. And so I cut the check. They stole my joy, but I realized they can't give me my joy back. You were having a good time, life was good, and somebody did something that caused a crisis that robbed your joy. And now it's like, you owe me, but they can't give you your joy back. But here's the good news, you don't need them to give you your joy back because you've got a resource in heaven that you can draw from. 
The Bible says that there's joy in the presence of the Lord. He'll give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. The baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us the fruit of joy in our life. So you don't need, you, they stole my peace. Now I've got anxiety. Now I've got stress. Now, now I'm freaking out. But you don't need them to give you your peace back because they can't give it back to you. But you can draw your peace from heaven. There's an unending source of peace that can come from heaven. He will keep you in perfect peace, the Bible says, if your mind is stayed on Him. There's a peace of God that surpasses all understanding, makes no sense, but God will keep your heart and mind in the knowledge of Him. Paul wrote to the Philippians and he said this, he said, you know what? My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Not according to your riches, according to His riches. And whatever you need, the debt to be paid for, you can draw it from heaven. Maybe if they took your purity, then God can make you whole again. Maybe they took your confidence. I don't know what they took from you. They cannot pay it back. So stop being angry at them and draw your supply from heaven. Pay the debt and then move on. Take authority over the situation. Here's the third thing that you need to do is you need to reconfigure the judgment. You need to learn how to reconfigure the judgment. Jesus made this statement on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. The New Testament teaches us that when we forgive, leave the vengeance to God. Let God have the judgment. The reason God says, let me have the judgment, is God is capable of righteous judgment. Not all judgment is the same. Judgment, righteous judgment, is a balance of judgment and mercy and learning the appropriate levels of what is needed. Sometimes more judgment's needed, sometimes more mercy is needed. God has the ability to judge correctly. So God says, leave the judgment to me. But when we reconfigure the judgment because we've forgiven, then we can step back and because we're not approaching it with anger, because we're not approaching it with vengeance, we are more capable of drawing on the wisdom of God and having righteous judgment. So sometimes righteous judgment is just forget about it. Just move on. In the case of the parable, the servant who was forgiven, who went out and threw the other servant in jail, that got reported back to the king. The king then threw him in jail, not because of his original debt, but because of what he did. So sometimes the judgment needs to be harsher. Like, I forgive you. I don't trust you. Because I don't need to trust you. You've got to earn trust. I give you forgiveness, but you have to earn my trust. And so while that doesn't hurt me anymore, I'm not sure I'm going to put myself in the position to be hurt like that again. And so you have to earn that level of trust in my life before I can trust you in that with my heart again. Sometimes righteous judgment is reporting it to the police. If you've been sexually abused, something like that's happened, and you've never talked about it, and you've hidden it, and you've been a prisoner to that, you forgive because you've been forgiven. They can't pay back what they stole from you. They can't heal you. They can't restore you. You don't need them to. You get it from heaven. And then you reconfigure the judgment. Well, now I'm not angry. Now I'm not like, oh, I want to hurt you. Now you're not coming out of anger. Now you say, okay, what's the right thing to do? If they can re-offend, then you have a responsibility to step out of the dark and protect somebody else from being hurt. And you step out of the dark and report it. Not because you want them to pay, not because you want them to hurt, not because you want some sort of vengeance, but because it's the wise thing to do to stop them doing that to somebody else. And so you have a responsibility. We say, John, I don't know how to deal with the situation. Well, that's the great thing about being in church, is that you've got a resource, you've got an asset, you've got friends, you've got leaders, you've got pastors, you've got counselors. We have people here who can help you. If you're online, you can connect with us. If you're at Bellevue, you can talk to leaders. If you're at Tacoma, you can talk, you can talk to people. I need some help. I've got to try to learn how to, uh, uh, I'm not angry and I'm not like, anymore. I, I've got peace and I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on top of it and I have authority. But I maybe need to step out and do something about it. Got to learn how to reconfigure the judgment. 
You receive the promise, know that you're forgiven. You've got to reciprocate the privilege. That's where the authority comes, is, is by forgiving those. Then you reconfigure the judgment. Should we just move on? Should I trust? Should I do something more? What's the right thing to do? What's the next step? And then the last thing that you do is you've got to repurpose the pain. You've got to learn how to repurpose the pain. Jesus made this statement on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. But the truth was they knew, they knew exactly what they were doing. These men were professional executioners. This was not their one and only crucifixion. They were experts in inflicting pain. Every action they did was deliberate. Not one was an oopsie. They didn't accidentally punch him in the face. They didn't accidentally scourge him. They didn't accidentally. So Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing was actually a little bit bigger than they're just crucifying me by accident. What he's saying is, Father, forgive them. They think they have the authority. They think they're ruling and reigning here. They think they're destroying me. They think they're messing things up. But what they don't realize is beyond this pain, there is bigger purpose. The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus was able to endure the cross. The cross was not nice. Jesus is not at one point like, woohoo, I like this. We should do crucifixion more often. Jesus wasn't doing that. When Jesus knew what was coming in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was sweating drops of blood saying, God, if there's a plan B, let's run with that right now. I'm not feeling crucifixion today. Maybe we could nuke two archangels. Maybe two archangels could equal a savior. Maybe he was trying to, and he's like, not my will. In other words, I don't really want to go through this. Forgiveness is not saying that you wanted to go through it and that it was enjoyable. It acknowledges the pain but it realizes there's a bigger purpose beyond the pain. For the joy that was set before him, he could endure it because he knew that you were coming at the other end of that cross. There was a, there was a young man in, in the Old Testament, his name was Joseph. 17, he was a dreamer. He was his dad's favorite son. And not subtly. It wasn't like his dad would walk up to him every now and then and go, hey man, I was going to let you know, don't tell your brothers, but you're my favorite son. No, he wasn't subtle. He made, his, he made Joseph a technicolor dream coat. His brothers are wearing beige. He's got like this multicolored jacket and he put it on every day and made a statement, I'm important. He'd go down to have breakfast and his brothers are eating bowls of Cheerios. He's got this big bowl of Fruity Pebbles. So he stood out and his brothers hated him for his dream and his jacket and his favor. They, 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 this is their plan. They said, let's kill him. Then they're like, now we can't kill him with our hands, but there's a pit. Let's throw him in the pit and let him die in the pit. Then we kill him, but we didn't touch him. Then they're like, oh, here's some Midianite traders. Let's sell him into slavery and get rid of him. And that's what they did. Years passed, decades. There's a famine in their land and the brothers need to go and try to find food. They make their way to Pharaoh's kingdom who's got the only food and supply in the time of famine. They meet with the second guy in charge, not knowing second guy in charge is Joseph. Joseph's gone through hell to get there. He's been in jail, falsely accused of rape. All these bad things have happened. Years of trauma. Years of never wondering whether his dream would become a reality. And they talk to Joseph. Halfway through the conversation, they have an aha moment. They realize this is Joseph. And they're like, oh, he's going to kill us. He's going to kill us. We're dead. Joseph looks at them and he makes this incredible statement. He says, you meant it for evil. I'm not giving you a pass. What you did was wrong. I was your brother, and you wanted to kill me. I don't care who you are, that's messed up. That was evil. It was bad. It was wrong. 
You meant it for evil, but God. But God. He says, but God, God, I, I wouldn't be here today if that didn't happen. And I'm only here today because that happened. It didn't make that good. It didn't make that enjoyable. But despite the pain I've walked through, I can repurpose my pain and I can understand I wouldn't have the platform that I have today had I not walked the pain that I'd walked through through all those years. So it doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily make that okay. It doesn't make what you did okay. That's still wrong. But I can repurpose it and realize that despite it being wrong, I take authority over it. I have kingdom authority and I realize that God had a bigger plan for me. You, you didn't see. But, but here's the deal, what Joseph didn't even understand. It was actually bigger. Did you know that Joseph's pain was actually bigger than that one statement? Because Joseph just thought he was keeping his family alive. But if Joseph knew the Bible like we know the Bible, this is what Joseph could have said. Judah, get out here, man. Judah, get out here. You meant it for evil. But Judah, had I not been here, Judah, you would have died in the famine. And Judah, you don't know this, but in your loins is the Messiah. So Judah, if you died in the famine, no one at Champion Center Tacoma, no one at Champion Center Bellevue, no one watching Champion Center online would have the opportunity of salvation because Messiah would have died in you. And so God used my pain to bring Messiah, Savior, to generations, thousands of years after I'm even alive. This thing is bigger than any one of us. So I don't know what your pain is. I'm not trying to make light of it and say it didn't hurt. I'm saying it did hurt. But kingdom authority is when you take authority over the hurt, you repurpose the pain and you realize it doesn't make it right. But somebody is walking through what you walk through and you can be the answer to their pain. You can minister to their hurt. You can minister to their brokenness. You can minister to their, God's got you beside somebody at work, somebody at college, somebody at school, somebody on the bus, somebody in the city. City, somebody in your neighborhood needs to hear the message of hope God's put in you when you repurpose the pain and take authority. How do you become great in the kingdom? You use those things that try to break you to be things that help somebody else get restored. As we just let that sink in for a moment, let's worship God together. Let's lift our hands, let's lift our heart. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you right now. Let's just sing right now this song. Thanks so much for joining us online. Here's what we would love for you to do. Click on the logo on your screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Every week we're uploading our messages, bonus content, and even some videos that are guaranteed to make you laugh. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.